It's been a good day. Heard two great messages today. The Lord's presence has been here. It's been a nice full day. Praise the Lord. Uh, you know, a, a doctor, I've been thinking about my message and how to approach you with it. And, uh, you know, we go to the doctor's office, he diagnoses you first, and then he tries to give you the cure. My message is called, I shall fear no evil. But first I have to diagnose the evil and the fear that causes it. Uh, and uh, then we'll try to get to the cure. All right. So if you hold, you pretty much learned about this now. If you hold uh, fast for the first 10, 15 minutes of my message, I always get to the good part. So uh, we'll get there. I'm sure. I shall fear no evil. You know where that's from, don't you? 23rd Psalm. I shall fear no evil. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, for your blessing, your anointing, the manifestation of your spirit and your presence, the manifestation of Jesus in our midst. And for this, we give you praise and honor and glory. Thank you, Lord, that in these times in which we live, we have a hiding place. We have a savior. We have a refuge. We have a rock. We're not going to be shaken, Lord. We're going to stand no matter what the test may be. Hallelujah. Now, Lord, quicken my mind. I've got to have your help tonight. I plead with you, Holy Spirit, that you come and quicken my physical mortal body, that I may speak as your oracle and not of my heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. There's a new plague coming upon the earth. And we've witnessed many plagues in our times, but this particular plague uh, is just beginning to affect our nation and the world. is moving very, very fast, and it's striking the rich and the poor. I'm talking about a plague of fear. And remember the plagues in Egypt of the frogs and the lice? They went into the homes of the pa- went into Pharaoh's palace, into the homes of the princes. There was no home that was spared this plague. And I tell you, the same thing is already beginning to happen. It, it is striking the White House. I believe the President of the United States. In fact, there was a statement that said that there's a, there's a, 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 there's an anger about uh, European. Uh, financial leaders who won't uh, uh, yield on some of the things that he's asking. Alan Greenspan, our federal uh, head of the Fed, has talked about his great worry and his concern, and this is in Congress, it's in the White House, it's in homes all over America and around the world. There is great fear, this plague striking rich and the poor, and not a single house of the unredeemed will miss this plague. Jesus himself warned that this plague would come. Remember his words, There shall be upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now, for the, the powers of the physical heaven, I mean, all the world's leaders, every institution, uh, in this world is going to be shaken. The Lord said, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. It appears he's already begun to do that. And even while I speak, this plague is growing more intense worldwide. Everywhere you look, <clears throat> nobody knows where it's going to end. Nobody knows how to control it. The IMF has just asked for $18 billion from our government. Congress doesn't want to pass it. They're trying to put together $100 billion as a one last ditch stand to stop the plague, or, or rather this terrible depression that has hit uh, all over the world on the east and the west and now about to attack Brazil and all of South America. Brazil needs $18 billion, I'm sorry, $40 billion to avoid a depression in the next three months. They're trying to put a hundred billion dollars, one last ditch effort to stop the depression from hitting America because Japan doesn't want that to happen. The world doesn't want to happen because we are the last market left for the goods of the whole world because we spend more, we consume, we're the biggest consuming nation in the world today. The New York Times had an article this past week. It says, the conditions worldwide are so ominous 
a global meltdown is underway. Now listen to this. The greatest need in the world today is for a strong world leader to show us the way out. An article from Russia at the same time said, we are doomed unless a strong leader comes up in our midst very soon. They're looking for a... We, can you understand how easy it's going to be for the Antichrist to come to power? Let me tell you how easy it is. Here in the United States, we have already traded our morals for prosperity. Right or wrong? We have absolutely traded. It doesn't matter uh, what's happening in the White House. The Oval Office can be turned into a bedroom. It doesn't matter as long as... Can you imagine 67% of the American people saying it's okay as long as we prosper? We have traded, we have traded our morals for prosperity. Can you see how easy a step it's going to be to trade, trade, pros, uh, trade, uh, uh, devil worship? Because the mark of the beast, we Christians will not be here, but the mark of the beast is, is connected clearly with devil worship. The worship of the beast. And I'm telling you, the whole world, there are many countries right now would sell their soul for prosperity. And we're at that point now. We, there are, will be millions who will worship the devil quickly as long as you give us prosperity. People will sell their very soul for prosperity in these last days. We don't want to give up the American dream. We don't want anything to change. And that's why we're in the moral mess that we're in right now. The prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 24, if you'll go there with me, please. The 24th chapter of Isaiah. <clears throat> he shows us how overwhelming this plague of fear is going to be in the last days. What a picture the prophet paints. Folks, uh, would you hear me on something for just a moment? Uh, there was a time I got weary of prophesying. This was about five years ago, and I told you from this pulpit, I said, Lord, people don't want to hear. I looked at their face because I, I'd rather just get people happy and, and let them go out marching out of the church, clapping their hands and feeling good. I want to be a feel-good preacher. Not all the time, but once in a while, Lord, make me be a good-time, happy preacher. And I told the Lord, so Lord, I'm tired of prophesying. And so the Lord lifted it from me. And, and I, I went almost five years without a prophetic word from the Lord. I, said, I, I, I saw the effect. Anywhere I go in the United States, the same thing. I, I mean, I'd be one of three speakers and everybody would be shouting and I'd get up and like a bomb drops. And I'd go back in a room. I'd, I'd tell my wife, I said, honey, I'm depressing everybody. But I had this burning fire. There's something, I was seeing things and I... I couldn't do it. And I tell you, I'm at the place now, I don't care how you look at me. And I, now, folks, listen, I'm not being, I'm not being facetious. I don't care anybody anymore because, uh, you know it, everybody sees it now. See, in, in fact, somebody picked up my book, said, well, this, this is nothing new. This has been happening. I said, he wrote it a year before. I mean, the manuscript was finished a year before it all happened, started. The, the, if, if you think it's hard sitting in a meeting, how would you feel like sitting in the congregation of Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel? You don't hear anything from these pastors or from me compared to these men. 24th chapter, beginning of 16th verse. Listen to this man. 24th chapter of uh, Isaiah. Did I say Isaiah? All right. You know what I did? Before I came to church, I checked all my scriptures this time to make sure <laughs> I got them right. Verse 16, from the uttermost part of the earth have we heard songs, even glory to the righteous. But I said, my leanness, my leanness, woe unto me. The treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously. Yea, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. He said, oh. He said, I'm beside myself. Every, there, everywhere you look, there's treachery and betrayal and wickedness. Fear and the pit and the snare are upon the inhabitant of the earth. It shall come to pass that he that flees from the noise of the fear 
shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh out of the midst of the pit shall be taken the snare. He said, everywhere you go, you, you try to get victory over fear, and then you're going to find, find yourself in a pit of despair. You get out of the pit of despair, and you're going to find a snare of, of hopelessness everywhere you turn. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundation of the earth do shake. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. It shall be removed like a cottage. And the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it. And it shall fall and not rise again. How would you like to hear such uh, uh, a message, such finality? You're going down, he said, you're not going to rise again. Incredible strong message. The earth utterly broken down. The earth is real to and fro like a drunkard. Folks, look at me. Do you understand that we're seeing that right now? I just was handed a letter before the service from a sister who's from Malaysia. Malaysia is in a total depression. And she says, please send your book to, and she named her president. And uh, we'll try to follow through on that because we gave a book to every congressman, every senator, and also to the White House. Now, whether they read it or not, I don't know. Most will just probably throw it away, but the witness was there anyhow. And God, on Judgment Day, will remind them of that. But in, in, in Indonesia and Thailand, Malaysia and Korea and Japan and Russia and, and nations that are utterly broken down. These words have been literally fulfilled before our eyes. We sit here now while you're sitting in this church what Isaiah is talking about has literally come to pass. I mean, physically, literally, it's there. We are there. This has never happened before in the history of the world. We're there. This is about today, and we're seeing it fulfilled right before our eyes. No wonder the headlines in news, Newsweek. This week, did you look at the headlines? The crash of 1999. Did you read the headlines of another... Fear spreads over the globe. Fear spreads over the globe. But now, the good part. I hope you're ready. While the whole world, the scripture said, is going to be plagued with fear, God has sent his own son to give us these incredible words, and I want you to list them and write them down in the tablets of your mind, with indelible Holy Ghost ink, he, Christ, would grant unto us that we be delivered, being delivered out of the hand of all our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. Now, this is God's standard. This is what God wants for all of his children. He says, no matter what happens, no matter what you see, I'm telling you by my spirit that I have for you a life, a whole life. God knew what was going to happen on our age, uh, in today. This is not catching God unawares. God's behind it all. He said he's the one who's going to be shaken. God knew then that he'd be shaking it while you're alive. You're now hearing this word. And he's saying to you, he's saying to me right now, I want you to live all your days, no matter what happens, without fear. Without fear. That's God's purpose. That's God's plan. He gave us the 23rd Psalm to reinforce it. He, he, he said, if you, if you know your shepherd, you know he's going to lead you beside still waters. He knows where the food is. He knows where the grass and the pasture is. And a good shepherd always goes forward out even when his sheep are resting, looking for pasture, looking for the water. And I want you to know, as long as you believe that you have a faithful, loving shepherd, he's, that's why David said, I have nothing to fear. I will fear no evil. I've got a shepherd with a rod there that can beat any lion, any bear. I've got a shepherd who loves me. He will lead me in green pastures and still waters. And while the world is shaking for the house of God, there are still waters and green pastures. For we've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You see, fear is a spirit that leads to bondage. It's a spirit that the devil himself, the Bible says, God clearly says he's not given us the spirit of fear. It's from the devil. 
God said, I'll give you a spirit of love and power and a sound mind. I've always said, if God didn't give it to me, I don't have to put up with it. God did not give it. It's from the devil himself, and he tries to inject a spirit of fear because most people who have on them the spirit of fear, they're in a bondage to fear itself, and it's never one fear. It's a whole mess, a whole bundle of fears. I call them nervous wrecks. Have you ever seen them? I, had some, I have some friends <clears throat> visiting us not too long ago, and uh, I said, he, he said, I read your book about America's last call. And she kind of bowed her head. I said, you didn't read it, did you? She said, no. And he said, I don't want her to read it. I said, well, because she's a nervous wreck already. she got so many things to worry about. She doesn't need another worry. I said, well, thank you. My friends. But you see, she worries about everything. You know, if you have a spirit a fear upon you, you are in bondage. It's not just about the economy, it's not about job or anything, it's about your kids, it's about your husband, it's about the future, it's about the fables of God, it's just a bundle of fears because you're under the bondage of a spirit of fear. Housewives are very susceptible to this. Now, I love you, dear sisters, God bless you, I'm not down on women, I'm not a feminist type, but I'm not down on women. I'm married to one of them. <laughs> a good one. But this is not God's plan for you to wake up every morning and start replaying your fears and going over them and over them opening the newspaper and listening to the news and just biting your nails and wondering when it's going to happen and, 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 and every time your husband comes in the door thinks he's got a pink slip and he's lost his job and what are we going to do and we ask all of these dumb questions. That, no, they're not dumb. They're, 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 they're just normal questions, but it gets dumb after a while. You do it every day as, oh, God, we're dead? This is a device... Satan uses against God's very elect trying to inject this spirit into their heart. Now let me talk to you about some of the fears that Christians have developed. Christians have to deal with these fears. I, I can name many, but there are three that Holy Spirit put in my heart to deal with. Now, I had no idea who's going to be in this service tonight. None at all. And so if, if you think somebody called me about you coming, you got it wrong. I want to talk to you first of all about the spirit, the fear of death. Hebrews 2.15 And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Their whole lifetime the fear of death. Nothing is more dishonoring to the Lord than for a believer who serves a Christ, who conquered death and took the sting out of it. Nothing is more dishonoring to him than Christians and believers who fear death. Folks, there's something that's perplexed me for years. I, I was born and raised in Pentecost. My dad and mom, granddad, grandpa, and great-granddad were preachers. And I, I, I came from uh, a long line of camp meetings where the saints of God would sing, I'm going to pass over Jordan into Canaan's fair land. Jordan was death. You pass over it. You go into Canaan's land. And people would shout, and they'd sing what we sang then, I'll fly away, I'll fly away. But when it came to fly away, <laughs> it came to cross Jordan, I, I saw Pentecostals who talked in tongue for 50 years, praising God and telling all us young people, praise God, I'm ready to go. And we Testimony meetings. Praise God, I'm saved and sanctified and on my way to heaven. And then they were told they were going to die. They got the news that, that, that they, they had a terminal disease, and they fell apart. And it bombed me. I, I, I'm thinking of one great woman of God, powerful preacher, and she got news that, you know, she had a bad heart, and her, her lips started. 
quivering and she fell apart. And it, it, honestly, it shook me up. It shook me up. I said, what, what's all this? All these years of talking about being ready to go and wanting to be with Jesus like Paul. And then why me, Lord? It should have been all oh, hallelujah. I'm, I'm almost there. I'm out of this mess. Contrast that with the young man who was my was my financial director when I was in crusade years ago. He was in his thirties, and he was Ron Porsche. He went to the doctor one day. He had a pain in his stomach, and went to the doctor, and they said, "You, you really need to get some X-rays and an MRI." And he got a test, and the doctor came back with the nurse, and they had that. A full look on their face, and they said, Mr. Porsche, we have to tell you, you're full of cancer, and you've got maybe two months to live. And the other nurses came in because they thought he'd pass out and scream. So they're used to people screaming and passing out and having a scene. And he sat there and he says, Oh, praise the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> praise the Lord. The doctor said, I said, you're going to die. <laughs> and the nurse, or chin hanging down, and uh, he, he wound up going around that room comforting everybody, <laughs> comforting the doctor. He went home, and uh, I went over his house. I, I heard that he had some bad news, and he's sitting in the room, and he, on the couch with a smile on his face. He said, brother, I'm dying. I'm going to be with Jesus. <laughs> Two lovely children, a beautiful wife. Well, what a man of God he was. I didn't know how much a man of God he was until that moment. And every day he wanted me over. He said, pastor, you preach a lot. Tell me what heaven's like. He said... I'm getting anxious. Tell me what it's all about. I want to know more. And every day I had to dig something else and take it over there and sit and talk to Ron for hours about heaven. And he had some some choruses about heaven and his wife would play that and he gathered around his children and they would sing and talk about heaven. And and I went over one day and and some people were there and it said we got to we got to fa- we got to pray this out of this man. We got to get him on his feet. He said, "Don't let him pray for me." He said, I am in a magnetic pool. I've already seen something of heaven. I don't want to stay here now. I've made provision for my family. They have good security. They have insurance. He said, I am in a magnetic pool. He said, you know that, don't you? I said, yes, I do. I said, you're in that pool? He said, I am, I am further on that side than I'm on this side. I don't want to come back. I'm already there. What a beautiful moment. It is two months later, he's sitting up in bed. They'd had a little prayer meeting and a little smile on his face. He dropped his head and went to glory. You see, this is a, it, it, the man or woman who conquers the sphere of death can't be touched by anything in this world. Not depression, physical, mental, has nothing, anything in the world. You, you can't hurt a dead man. You can't hurt a dead woman. Paul said, I die daily. I don't mean that. I don't think it was just the cross. I believe he got up every day and said, I, this may be my crowning day. I die to everything in this world, to its pleasures, to its money, to everything there is. Folks, this is not the real world. This is all fantasy. The real world is on the other side. All their lifetime Bound by the fear of dying, the fear of death. I talked to a man this past year who got the word that he had three months to live, and I went to the hospital to visit him. And and uh, I didn't know what to say. I said, I'm very sorry to hear the news that give you three months to live. And he said, well, Reverend, he said, let me tell you what. He said, life is like a deck of cards. I just got handed a bad hand. I got dealt a bad hand. You, to, to this dear man, life 
is a deck of cards and fate determines it all. I just got dealt a bad hand. As though God had nothing to do with it. Folks, it's not a bad hand for the Christian. This, this is resurrection. This is life. This is glory. You say, well, Brother Dave, you can preach that. You have good health. I wonder if you could preach it if you had just gotten your notice. Well, here's what the Lord told me. There are some of you here that are very close to it, and maybe some of you got the notice. And the Lord made, made it very, very clear to me that if you will allow him by his Holy Spirit to remove all fear of death, it can be the most glorious experience you've ever had, surpassing anything in your past life, even in your walk with God. You will like, you will like Stephen see the heavens open and there'll be that magnetic pull. My son-in-law's mother, my wife is here too. I remember dying of cancer in the hospital and, and the same word to her. Everybody around her was, was praying and, and, and saying, be healed, be healed, be healed. And, and, and the Lord had spoken to my heart. She was going to go. And the Lord had told her the same thing. And so after they all left, these, these were people who were in what was called the prosperity gospel, and they were not going to take no. No way. She is not going to die. We'll never die. She's going to be raised up. And after they left, I went in and she, she, she said, Pastor Dave, you know, don't you, what God's told me? I said, yes, I do. And she, she said the same thing. She said, I feel like a, a, a magnet is drawing me. I'm getting closer and closer. I want to be with him now. Please, Brother Dave, tell them to stop pressuring me. I want to be home with the Lord. She had one of those beautiful departures you could ever imagine. And some of those dear people thought that it was my lack of faith that did her in. I mean, if you'd only had faith, I didn't care. I knew what was in her heart. I knew what the Lord was doing in her heart. And I thank God. Deal with it now. Ask God to take that fear out of your heart. And if you, if you, if you lose the fear of death through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will not fear anything that happens in this world again. You won't fear what happens to your children or, or to life, to your job, your home. This is the number one fear all their lifetime bound by this fear of dying. To be absent from the body is what? Be present with the Lord. You know what Jesus said his last prayer? Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am that they may behold my glory. Folks, before you were born, he was wishing you to be with him already. To his disciples, he's looking around, Lord, I wish they all could come with me now. He's been wishing, he's been waiting. I desire, Lord, that all of these, thank God for life, thank God for ministry, but my real desire is they be with me to see my glory. That's the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have you ever been in a, in a hospital or a sick room of a wicked person? Have you ever seen? Now, one of two things. If they're judicially blind, they just block everything out. And, and that, that's why people want to be cremated and they want their, 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 somebody throw some of my ashes in the Atlantic, some throw them in the Pacific and throw them to the wind so they won't have to be resurrected. They think on the judgment day. Now, folks, if you're planning to be cremated, don't. I'm not giving you some doctrinal kind of thing here. But I want to tell you something. I've seen, I've seen the wicked die, and I've seen the despair, and I've seen the hopelessness. And the Bible said, "We don't despair like the world despairs." And God, God wants every one of us in this building tonight. Every one of us. To say, Lord Jesus, I want to face death, look it right in the eye, and say, I am not afraid to die. Because absent from the body, I'm present with the Lord. What else do you need? What could be more glorious? If that if that's not glory to you, you don't know him. 
You're not intimate with him. You don't want to be with him like I want to be with him, like all those who have, have known him. There has to be this. Uh, this world is not. It's not worth it. I thank God for my family. I love them. I thank God for this church and the ministries allowed them to be a part of it. Folks, my heart is not here. It, in a way it is, but my real desire is with him. Now, that didn't make you shout, but it's truth. It'll set you free. The fear of drawing near to the Lord. The fear of drawing near to the Lord. This, this has been one of the great quandaries of my life also. It, it, it's really been, it's, it's bothered me for years. Why, why certain Christians, listen close, certain Christians who are the most loving people in the world, they'll do anything for anybody. Some that have, many have walked with God for a number of years, but they're the same place they were years ago because they don't have a passion, a passion that would lead them to have a daily prayer life, a passion that takes them to the Word of God every day to get to know Jesus better. They're just good people. But the quandary I've had is saying, Lord, why is it that there are so many Christians who don't draw near to you through the Word and through prayer they're not, they're not, they don't have a certain hour a day where they just go in and shut themselves in with the Lord and have that drawing to the Lord. They don't draw near to Him. He, he just kind of lays easy on the back roads of their mind. It, it's, it's just, I, I know I'm saved. I know Jesus. Or I know I'm going to heaven because I'm saved by faith. I'm justified by faith. Yes, they're justified and probably will make heaven. Some, I wonder, if they will, I wonder if they won't be really shocked when they stand before the Lord and say, I gave you all the examples of the word, what happens to those who neglect. How do we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And I can't really guarantee that you could be saved. But I would, I'll tell you this. It's been a quandary for me. All my ministry, every, er, everywhere I've gone in evangelism and pastoring and everything else, why there are so many Christians who can sit under fiery sermons, uh, about diligence before God, about seeking God, that faith comes by hearing and the need to pray and get intimate with the Lord. And about the only time they draw nigh to the Lord is when they come to the house of God. And if you've got to a dead church, then you really got a problem because you're not getting it in your closet. You're not getting it in the pulpit and you're living on an experience that's 20, 30, 40, 50 years of age, uh, old. Or if you're just a young convert, something 10 years ago, and you don't have that fresh word from the Lord, you're really not intimate with Him, and yet you expect someday the trumpet's going to sound, and suddenly you're going to have that intimacy with Him. And it amazes me. It, 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 it absolutely bothers me. It's mind-boggling. I've been trying to figure it out. I have spent hours and days with God and the Word saying, well, explain that to me. Explain that to me, that people who are so loving, who give, who care about people, are intimate with people, have a hard time drawing close to you. And, and what he seemed to speak to my heart in the past few days I was thinking of uh, John on the Isle of Patmos when he saw Jesus in all of his majesty and his glory. He falls down on his face, petrified. And Jesus comes and lays his hand on John's right hand on John's shoulder and says, John, don't be afraid. He said, I am the first and the last. And folks, that, that is really the message of the Holy Spirit for the church. Whenever you have a fear of any kind, he, he comes by his spirit, and lays his hand and he says, look, I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to be at ease in my presence. But there are many, many people who are not at ease in the presence of the Lord. They're not at ease at all. Or if they were, they would be there. Why aren't they there? They're, they're not easy. They are not at ease in the presence of the Lord. There has to be a reason for that. There are, there are some who, who I believe honestly say, I don't pray. I don't see God. I, I don't read my Bible because I've neglected it so long. Somehow, way back, I got away from seeking God daily, and I, ha I developed a habit of neglect and forgetting, and it's kind of too late to change, and I'm in a rut now, uh, 
I, I try to read my Bible. I don't understand it. The words run together. Or I fall asleep. Or I'll make a pledge that I'll do it and I'll last a week. And then I break the pledge and I'm back to my old ways. And I'm afraid I can't change. I'm afraid I, 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 I've already developed these habits and I can't change. And so there, I think there's a hesitancy, there's a fear in going, getting too close to the Lord because of a sense of failure, a sense that I've already missed the boat. I, I've been at this too long. I don't think I'll ever have a close, intimate walk with God. So we substitute love for people and closeness to people. We, 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 we substitute other things. And then we lay back, just, there's, there's always this nagging fear. Well, what if I stand before God and do have to answer for that? There's always that nagging there. But we always cover it up somehow. But I sense that there's a fear in some people of not really drawing near because it's too late. I'm telling you, it's never too late. I don't care where you are. You can start tonight. You could go home tonight and get your Bible out and say, Lord, I have neglected this word and I'm sorry for it. And I'll neglect it again unless you, by your spirit, woo me to it. Unless you begin to un help me understand it. And, Lord, I've not been praying as I should. I'm not intimate with you. I'm going on an experience of the past. And I'm telling you, Lord Jesus, I know that time is getting short. I know it's all wrapping up. And when I stand before you, I don't want to be a stranger to you. I don't want you to say I never knew you because you neglected me. That you became a stranger to me. And the Jews took for granted all my blessings. Don't do that. The Lord lay his hand on you right now by a spirit and said, don't be afraid. Come on back. You can start all over again and I'll forget all the past. If you'll just start right now, even if I come another week and you have a week with me, I'll receive you. Start over. Start over again. It's never too late. Now, folks, in all honesty, <clears throat> listen to an old man. In all honesty, if that kind of loving teaching, if that kind of a loving appeal doesn't reach your heart, then the Holy Ghost can't reach you. I'm going to tell you like it is. In his love and wonderful loving invitation where he doesn't even chase at you. He just says, all right, I'll forgive you, but come on back. And if you can walk out of here tonight and that doesn't change your life. And one day I stand before judgment seat. When all your works burn, you have nothing to offer him but your physical body. And you've got no fruit because all of your goodness to other people and all the things you've done are going to burn if you don't have that relationship with him. There's, there's, there's another thing that I'm thinking about the Lord put on my heart. There are some that are afraid to draw nigh because into his presence because they're struggling with a temptation. They're struggling with a sin. And they've tried so hard and they've failed so often. And they say, after all the preaching, after learning about the doctrines of the church, about learning about intimacy with Jesus and, and trying the best I know how, I'm still where I was. I, I fall. I'm being tempted. And there's a tendency to have a fear of drawing nigh to the Lord because he's so holy and I'm so unholy and I just don't think he could receive me. I don't think I can be brought back to a place of victory. Oh, there's there's so many like that that don't draw nigh to the Lord. They don't get close to him. They're afraid of, that God will not receive them. I want to tell you something right now. He, he is here in this building right now by a spirit 
to lay his hand on you. He's here in his holiness. Yes, he's here in his majesty. If our eyes could be open and see his holiness, we would fall like petrified men and women on our faces before him. But still he put his hand on you. I don't care if you were murdered tonight. I don't care if you had a thousand demons in you, legions of demons. If you just reached out to him, he'd stretch out his hand and say, come on, come to me. My arms are open. I'll heal you. I'll receive you. No matter what you've been through, no matter what your temptation, no matter what kind of a fall you've had, if you will get up and come to me now, come now, start over and believe right now that I will endue you with the power that you need. But don't turn away from me. Don't turn your back on me. Run to me. Run to me with your sin. Run to me with your guilt. Run to me with your condemnation. Bring it all to me. Bring it to me. And just start loving me. Just repent and see if I'll not touch you by my hand once again and restore everything the worms have eaten. See if I'll not restore you. You see, there's, there's this terrible fear of drawing nigh to the Lord lest he either expose something or not receive us or because we have neglected him so long. It's the only thing I can figure out. If you're waiting to be good enough to draw nigh to the Lord, you've got a long way. You'll never make it. I'm never good enough, never will be. You know what I pray. I've told you many times. Lord, I've got no plea. I have no plea. Not even my prayers have any merit. I, I, I told you I gave you an all man. I'm going to seek you till you bless me. But if I sought you 24 hours a day and didn't sleep, that all my prayer, all my Bible reading has no merit whatsoever. It's the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. Let me talk to you about the final fear, the fear of temporal suffering. Temporal means... <clears throat> Transitory things of life, the things of the earth. The fear, this fear is probably the greatest fear among unconverted men and women. The fear of poverty, the fear of a recession, depression, the fear of losing all that they have spent their lifetime. Can you imagine spending lifetimes accumulating things? And they're, they're taken away one by one. I told you last Sunday of those that were long-term investment, this multi-billion dollar uh, <clears throat> hedge fund that went bankrupt. They rescued it temporarily with three and a half billion dollars from some bankers here. And uh, multi-millionaires who overnight went into bankruptcy, losing everything. They had learned to develop fine taste for $100 bottles of wine, uh, fancy cars and golf courses and and high living and multi-million dollar homes. And now overnight, it's uh, just a piece of vapor, uh, some vapor and smoke, and it's all gone, all gone. One man said, easy come, easy go. It's amazing. But you see, this is the fear that's pressing now upon mankind but let me tell you, it's, I, I believe it's an awful sin for God's people who are looking point blank at the promises of God, have all the promises of God that yea and may, man to all who believe, and still not trust, still bound by fear. First John 5.18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has torment, he that feareth is not made perfect, the word there is complete, is not made complete in love. He said, "There's if, if you are living in fear, you're tormented. And he said, more than that, that gives reason, th this is proof that you have not, there's something wrong with your love for Jesus. There's something wrong about your love for Jesus. If you love him, you have confidence in him. If you love your husband or wife, there's trust. There's confidence. And he said, again, there is no fear in love. No fear in love. That's why we press so strongly about you getting close to Jesus 
and drawing nigh to him. Folks, it's a simple matter of giving him quality time. And in that quality time, you trust his word. I, I don't know whether, if, when I examined my own life, I said, Lord, you, you said he that have my commandments and keep them, he is that loveth me. But one of his commandments is that we go into the secret closet and we pray and seek, we shut the door. And I, I go through this, literally, I told you. I go into my craving room, I put my hand on the door, and when it's still, I close. I say, Lord, I'm closing the door. I talk to him like that. I'm closing the door, and I walk away from the door, said, now, I've, I've shut the door. Maybe I'm just too simple. I don't know, but this works for me. I said, Lord, you said if I shut that door, and I turn, and there's nobody here, I'm in no hurry. This is your time. This is our time. I'm here to love you and I'm here to learn. And I, I, first of all, I give him praise and thanks. They come in his courts with praise and thanksgiving for all that he's done. I just thank him for my salvation. I thank him I don't have to come by works. I thank him I don't have to sweat. I don't have to do anything but love him and draw near to him. I shut that door and I said, Lord, you made me a promise. If I shut that door, seek you in secret, you would reward me openly. And the only open reward I want is a full revelation of who you are. That's according to your word. I believe it. I receive it by faith. And folks, when I come out of that room, I don't care if the mountains shake and fall. I don't care what happens because I have, I come out of that room with his assurance in his presence, not afraid anymore because I've been in love with him and I've just had a wonderful intercourse with the Lord and it's put a smile on my face and peace in my heart. Remember when Jesus was asleep in the boat when it was rocking in the storm? And they were saying, Lord, save us. We're going down. Folks, we're, we're in a rocky boat right now. The United States is in a, in a boat that is rocking. There's a storm. The storm is already here. It's rocking. But I want to tell you, Jesus is in the boat. Jesus is in this boat. Hallelujah. Jesus is in New York City. Jesus is with Times Square Church. Jesus gets up and speaks a word and suddenly everything calms. The storm is calm. And they look around and say, what kind of man is this? What matter of man is this? Folks, this is what you and I have to have. We talk about Jesus. We use his name. We talk about intimacy with him. Well, what kind of man is he? He is God, but he's man. Hallelujah. Let me tell you what kind of man this is. This is the man who said, Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? Not one of them is forgotten before God. But even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are worth more than many sparrows. What kind of man is this? The man who doesn't even let a sparrow die without counting him? Not even a bird falls? Not even a bird is shot down? Not a bird dies of a natural cause without the Heavenly Father? He knows all about it. He said every hair on your head is counted. What kind of man is this? What kind of man is this? He said, consider the ravens, for that they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, but God feeds them. How much more are you better than the fowls? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They don't toil, they don't spin. Yet I say to you that Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of them. If God so clothe the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... How much more will he clothe you, O oh, ye of little faith? God says, if you want to know who this man is, go out and look at your grass. It's green one day. I gave it, I made it green. I took care of your grass. I took care of your flowers. And they only lasted a short time. I've given you 70 years. When I take care of you, I've numbered the hairs on your head. You think I can't pay your bills? You can't even count your hairs. <laughs> what kind of man is this? 
Our Father, he said, knows what you have need of, and seek not what you shall eat, what you shall drink, neither be of doubtful mind, for all these things the nations of the world seek after. Your Father knows that you have need of all these things. So you seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. My goodness, if he's going to give us the kingdom, he's going to give me breakfast. David said, I sought the Lord, he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. I sought the Lord, and I got the victory over my fears. Oh my. I'm going to wrap this up. Let me tell you where the Lord, what the Lord spoke to me about closing tonight. The Bible says that some in the wilderness did provoke him because he promised them a rest. He promised that he'd take them through that they, they would be guided correctly, easily with the cloud by day and a fire by night. But even though the cloud was there, they provoked him. Let me tell you who really provokes the Lord probably more than anybody else. <clears throat> this is the Christian who has failed God. Perhaps backslidden who's allowed fear to enter his heart, that he or she can never come back into his good grace and never be fully restored. <clears throat> now, I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but God made it so clear in prayer this afternoon that I had to add this. It wasn't in my message, but to add this. It was added this afternoon in prayer. I don't know who I'm talking to, but there's a fear in you. Because you have really, you're not where you were, you have failed God. I don't know what kind of sin it is, I don't care if it's drifting or backsliding, whatever it is, but there's a fear in you. You've developed uh, a fear that the Lord will not forgive you, or if you come back, you'll fall. Let me give you an illustration before I close to tell you what this is all about and why I believe the Lord put in my heart. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, a drug addict young lady came in and was saved under my ministry. I was in Pittsburgh at the time. She came to my crusade and gave her heart to the Lord. Wonderful conversion. Married one of our drug-addicted converts, a, a saved convert. And they developed a wonderful drug, drug program here in the United States. A very successful program. It was not Teen Challenge, but it was another wonderful couple. God did such a great work in their heart. Probably 12, 15 years after they were saved, he took a fall back to heroin. And then somehow, she, she uh, through, through, through medical problems, uh, of an habituation to medical drugs, they got exposed and had to leave the ministry. <clears throat> And uh, my wife and I got a call from them. They were in Florida at the time in a little hotel, motel. And they were going to, it was going to be a double suicide. And they called us to say goodbye. And I was going over there with my wife this afternoon, getting the details straight. And she remembered it well. And I, I prayed with them and I said, look, you, if you... If you will please, I said, do you have enough money to get, we were in Texas time, do you have enough money to get to Florida up here? We're going to wait for you, Not don't do anything till we get here. And I prayed against that spirit of death and suicide. And they said, we'll come. And they, they two broken hearted people who really loved God deep inside. They'd never lost that love for God, but they felt, they felt they had failed God. They had failed me. They had failed everybody. And more, it was the reproach that they brought on the Lord. Said, better dead than to, to, to live with this reproach. They came to Texas heartbroken, health, health broken. They just barely made it there. 
And it was about three days of bathing them in prayer. Just, just ministering the love of Jesus. And, and it was the same thing. How can God forgive what we have done? We, we had everything. The testimony. We, we have reproached the Lord in front of drug addicts. We had to get up in front of all the people. They, they knew we had cheated and all this. He, he was so heartbroken. He said, Brother Dave, how can God forgive a man like me? I had been saved from the pits. He, he was so merciful to me. He said, I was stealing God's money to buy drugs. I was taking offerings. I, I, I was going out telling people I'm witness on the street and I was connecting for drugs. He said, if you only knew we messed up, how can God ever forgive us? They, they didn't want to even approach the Lord. There was such a fear in their heart of even, even, even praying. But boy, one night as we prayed, the spirit of the Lord came through and the love of Jesus, the same Christ who laid his hand on John and said, don't be afraid. I'm the beginning and the end. Spirit of God came on both of them. They began to weep and all of that poison, all of that fear drained out, literally drained. They put their arms around each other and it was... I mean, just trembling. He's here. He's here. He's real. He's forgiven. He, he's merciful. The mercy of God came through to, to them in such a powerful way. And, and, and for the next week, we watched uh, the health come back and we got them some new clothes and, and uh, the restoration began. And, and I want you to know that those two are in the ministry today and they're in the ministry now. <clears throat> Some of you may have read a book. Please make me cry. Cookie Rodriguez. Great, wonderful couple. Such a, she had never cried in her life. Sat in one of my meetings with Catherine Kuhlman. And she would said, God, if you can make me cry, I'll give you my life. And as soon as she said that, she started to cry. Ran down the altar and got saved. What a merciful Savior. What a merciful God we serve. He wants to take all fear out of your heart. He wants you to come and be at ease in his presence. No matter what you've done, you, just, you, you absolutely you just get up from your despair. You get up from your agony and say, Jesus, I'm coming home. I'm coming to you. I want your hand on me. I trust you now. Will you stand, please? You don't have to wait till I give an invitation. If God's already invited you, come on down. Up in the balcony, you go to the stairs on either side, you come on down. And, and say, Brother Dave, I want to be restored now. I, I, you hit me tonight. The word touched me. There's, this was meant for me tonight. I want you to come right now. If you've been slipping away from the Lord, if you feel you failed Him, or, or you, you, you say, Brother Wilkson, there was something meant for me in this message tonight. I want God to touch my life. Up in the balcony, come on down, any aisle. We're going to pray with you right now. Praise the Lord. Now look at me, please. I'm a preacher. I'm a man of prayer. But I'll tell you what. I wouldn't. I, it's not natural for the human man to pray or seek God. It's not natural. It doesn't come naturally. It, it's something you have to pray that God helps you with and draws you and woos you. I, as soon as, as I'm done praying, I don't care how wonderful it's been. I said, Lord, tomorrow's coming, and I may not have that same desire, and it's not in me. You put the desire, you woo me, you draw me. And he's faithful to that. He'll do it by his spirit. And suddenly, you, you will find that it, you're looking forward to it every day. Find a place to seek him. Find a place. Would you, would you confess tonight, if you have to, your neglect of this book? And say, Lord, I've just been opening it and looking for, uh, like Brother Carter said something to confirm what I want to do. 
Or would you open it up and start devouring the Psalms because the Psalms are all about Jesus? And open up your heart to the Word and say, Lord Jesus, I'm not going to do it because the pastor asked me because I want to draw closer to you. I want to draw nigh to you. Will you pray this prayer with me right now from the depths of your heart? And there's so many congregations need to pray this also. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I, come to you I come to you to confess, to confess my, neglect. my neglect. I have not sought you. I have not, have not prayed like I need to and like I want to. I've neglected your prayer and I've neglected your word. But Lord, I know you'll forgive me and I want to start over. I want a life of prayer. I want a life of the word. Holy Spirit, draw me to this. Put it in my heart to follow through now. Forgive me, Jesus. I'm sorry, and I repent. And of all my sins and everything that I've done to grieve the Holy Spirit, come, precious blood of Jesus, be sprinkled upon my heart. I receive now your forgiveness, and I receive your love. Jesus, I'm convinced now you love me in spite of my failures, you're not going to let me go. Raise your hands and just love him right now. Just love him. So I love you, Jesus. I give you praise. I give you thanks for your utter faithfulness to me. You've been good to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the conclusion of the message.